the Bible says that we should definitely accrue wealth, but maybe the currency the Bible talks about is not what we think of, and it's certainly not what the world thinks of. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. You guys have heard this passage millions of times. Uh, it's a well-known passage in what we all know as the Sermon on the Mount. And in this chapter, Jesus is giving instructions for living our daily lives. And, and in this chapter, he says, when you give, here's how you do it. You know, do it like this. And then he goes on to say, do it in secret. Don't do it publicly. And then he says, when you pray, here's how you do it. And then he goes on and talks about the Lord's Prayer being a model for, for praying and, and, and use that as a guideline when you pray. And then he says, when you fast, here's how you do it. And then he says, don't do it publicly and don't try to be seen by men, but, but do it privately. Then he gives instructions on accruing wealth, but he changes, he tweaks it a little bit. He says, when you accrue wealth, here is where you should accrue it. What happened to how? <laughs> that, that now he switches from all the how to do, how to do, how to do. And he says, here's where you do it. Now, this is a somewhat of a strange teaching because he doesn't say, when you accrue wealth, here's how to do it. He says, when you accrue wealth, here's where you should accrue it. Read that passage with me. I'm going to read it, but and you can either follow along or, or look it up if you want to. It's in John 6, 19 through 21, and it is a familiar passage. You've heard it many times. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust and destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For when you're, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I, I reflected on that a lot about he does not tell us how to do that. And what that means normally when he doesn't say how is he's implying you know how. And, and when he says that, it means either we'll know it intuitively or the spirit will lead us into how to do it or the scriptures will tell us how to do it. So today, what I want to do is look at what the scriptures say about how to lay up treasure in heaven. Let me begin by saying that you first need to come to Christ. And I know pretty much everybody in our class uh, are believers. Um, uh, but I never know how, when I teach a class, how far reaching it might be. And that's a good thing for all of us to, to remember. In the world we live in today, the things you say are a lot far reaching and last, more far reaching and last a lot longer than you thought. So I don't know where this lesson might end up. But the first thing uh, we all need to do is come to Christ and secure your place in heaven. It does no good to lay up treasure in heaven if you are not going to be there to enjoy it. So. Uh, if you've done that, here are seven ways to lay up treasure in heaven. One, make a conscious decision to lay up treasure in heaven. Paul wrote in Colossians 3, 1 through 4, he says, If ye be, re be risen with Christ, he started from the premise that we're talking to all believers here. He says, If ye then be risen with Christ, if you are a believer, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. In other words, if you're a believer, you love Christ, you desire to be with him, then seek those things that are around him in heaven. Pursue those things that are going to be in heaven with you and with him. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him, in glory. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever taken, and I know many of you own businesses and, and, and have had significant management positions in business. And so at some point in time, you've probably taken a leadership conference or a management conference or some kind of training on how to build an organization or how to build a personal wealth or how to build this, that, and the other. And if any of you have ever taken any of Zig Ziglar's uh, seminars on being successful. He always starts with a spiritual component, which I love about him. But generally, right out of the box, and I would pose this as a question if I was with you, but generally, right out of the box, the first thing they're going to tell you if you're trying to accrue wealth is to 
set goals. Almost invariably, the first thing they do if you're ever in any kind of a financial seminar, they say set a budget. In other words, establish goals. And so the first thing, if, if you want to let churches in heaven, the first thing that we all have to do is to set that as a goal, to decide that that's going to be a primary goal, maybe the primary goal in my life and work towards that end. Determine what you want and make that your target and then develop a plan to get there. Now, most of you guys know I'm in a group called CBMC, Christian Businessmen's Committee, uh, shortened to CBMC, and I've talked about it before. Now, in this group, we occasionally have to memorize scripture. But many of the men in this group complain that memorizing scripture is, is difficult to do, especially as we get older. Uh, but I was in a recent meeting of, what, uh, of, of, of men in that group, and, and in the discussion, uh, it became evident that no one had made memorizing scripture a priority. They all just say, gee, it's hard to do and move on from there. Not one of them had said, I'm memorizing scripture as a priority. I've set it as a goal. I've started spending X amount of time each day because if you set something as a goal, it's going to start taking some of the time out of your life. That normally if you set a goal, then you put little goals under it. Like if your goal is to memorize scripture, you'll probably put underneath that, spend 30 minutes a day looking at scripture. You know, number two, recite scripture back to my wife or, or whatever. Number three, you know, meet with a group of men where we share scripture. You'll, you'll do things like that. Not one of the men in this group had set memorizing scripture as a goal. And so no one was memorizing scripture. Everyone was just complaining about how hard it is to do. So we decided to do that in that group. And so this Tuesday, I'm having a luncheon. And the first luncheon we're having after this meeting is we all have to come to that meeting with certain scriptures memorized. Now, I think we'll probably all do that. They're not difficult scriptures. And the reason we'll do it is because we set that as a goal. If you're going to lay up treasures in heaven, then you have to set that as a goal. We have to make that a priority in our life, to seek those things that are above, as Paul tells us to do in Colossians 3. That brings us to number two. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. Wow. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. Now, when I hear something like this, I always think of that guy that's walking along the edge of the cliff, and he stumbles, and he falls over the edge of the cliff, and, and, and you may have heard the story, and as he's falling, he reaches out, and he grabs this little tiny sapling, this little tree that's sticking out from the side of the cliff, and he's holding on to that, dangling a thousand feet above what is certain death, and he prays there as he's hanging, and he says, Lord, please rescue me, and then he hears a voice from up above, and it says, turn loose of that little tree. And the man says, who is this? And the voice says, it's me, the Lord. I am answering your prayer. Turn loose of the tree, and I will catch you and save you. The man thinks about this for a minute, and he says, is there anyone else up there? That's exactly the kind of life we live, that we pray and we ask God to be supernatural for us but when he attempts to be supernatural we want to get it back to something we can control something that we have a part of and this is a hard teaching that that this sell everything you have and give it to the poor is a hard teaching when you read in scripture where it says this was a hard teaching that means people usually grumbled and then some of them walked away and that would precipitate jesus to say usually to the disciples something like he did in this case it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than to a rich man to get into heaven. It's hard teaching because when we hear it, we don't to want to obey it. Now, you guys all know the passage in Matthew 19 and again in Mark 10, where a rich man comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus goes through a litany of the commandments. He says, you know the rules, don't murder, uh, don't commit adultery, uh, don't steal, uh, honor your father and your mother, and, and he goes through the commandments. And, and then the rich man, he says, I've done all these things since birth. And then Jesus says, one thing thou lacks, sell all you have and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Two parts to this instruction from Jesus himself. The first is sell all you have. Does this really mean sell everything you have? 
maybe. What it does mean is don't become too attached to the things you own in this life to the point where you're not prepared to give them up because folks, and this is gospel, folks, sooner or later, you're going to give them up. You may hang on to them a little longer or a little shorter, but sooner or later, you're going to have to give them up. Solomon learned this lesson and he laments it in Ecclesiastes. He says, and I love the picture in my mind, scriptures. I see people in my mind in scripture when they're doing things. I can see him sitting in the palace and he's sitting there in his, on his throne and he's drumming his finger. And he says, you know, one of the bad things about life is you spend your whole dang life accruing wealth and then you die and then you end up leaving it to someone who didn't earn it and they'll spend it without consulting. That's the truth. That's exactly what's going to happen. When Susie and I die, unless we make some really bad decisions going forward, we're probably going to leave a fair amount of money to our kids. And they had no part in earning it. None, zero. In fact, they played a negative role. If we hadn't had those suckers, we'd probably have a lot more money than we do. Uh, uh, that they've actually depreciated the value of our uh, investments. But when we die, they're going to get it. And I can assure you, at least one of my oldest ones, she's going to give it to some places. I don't want it to go. I'm tempted to write my will. I'm going to leave you this amount of money. But there, you have to check with the lawyer before you spend it. And you can't give it to this organization. Now, I don't know if I'm able to do that or not. But I certainly have that on my mind because my kids are going to end up with what material things we have and they're going to spend it in a way that I probably don't appreciate it. Um, it makes me think about my dad. Um, my dad once said to me, he says, don't expect to inherit anything from me. He said, if I feel the big one coming on and I've got two bucks in my pocket, I'm ordering a cup of coffee. That was true. Out of my dad's mouth, he said, don't expect to get a nickel for me. If I've got any money in my pocket, he said that. And he said, if I've got two bucks in my pocket and I feel the big one coming out, I'm ordering a cup of coffee. Now, obviously, that was before Starbucks when you could get a cup of coffee for two bucks. And you can't get one nowadays. But he said, don't expect to inherit anything. I've thought about that a lot. I would love for my money to run out five minutes before my life was. And then I don't have to worry about how my kids are going to spend it. We all, our earthly wealth is going to go away. We are all going to forfeit it. And the question is, do I forfeit it now in exchange for treasure in heaven? Or do I forfeit it later after it's too late to exchange it for treasure in heaven? The key here is that the wise man doesn't spend too much time accruing earthly wealth to leave to someone else. Now, this scripture in Matthew has been examined many times about what Jesus was saying and what he really meant. And there are layers to it. And of course, there's layers to every single scripture. But the fact remains at face value, he says, sell all you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Now we looked at sell all you have. What about giving to the poor? To begin with, this is not the only place where laying up treasure like this and giving it to the poor is mentioned in scripture. In Luke 12, Jesus is saying, don't worry about your go what you're going to eat and what your clothes are going to be and what, what you have to wear and if you're going to be warm enough. And don't worry about all those things. It's just because your Heavenly Father knows you need those day-to-day -day things. So don't spend much time thinking about that because if God has any power at all, he can certainly provide those things for you. So, so Jesus is saying, trust God for those things. You don't have to worry about it. And then he says, of course, the great verse that we all know, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. And we all like to think that if we seek the kingdom of God, we'll get all these material things. But Jesus, like he often is, is talking about the spiritual things. Now, at this point, we usually stop with that passage. And so we don't hear him saying, it gives your heavenly father great pleasure to give you the kingdom. Just sell what you have and give all. What are alms? Now, A-L-M-S. -A Most of you know that if you study any scripture. If you've been in my class or any other Bible teacher's class, you know that alms are what we give to the poor. You've even seen movies where people are walking along going, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. So it's money or, or resources that we give to, to poor. 
Remember, Peter and John went to pray, and the man came along and said, alms for the poor, and that's when Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have, I'm going to give to you, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. That man was expecting to get a few shekels, and Peter gave him more than he could ever imagine. God wants to do the same things in our life, if we'll be even reasonably obedient. Alms are what you give to the poor. If you do this, Jesus says, it will accrue to you as treasure in heaven where thieves don't steal and moths don't corrupt. So giving to the poor is an important way to lay up treasure in heaven. Now, there are lots of other scriptures about how God views the poor and wants us to see them. One of my favorites, favorites is Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever helps the poor lends to the Lord. Gosh, I love that scripture. I just think, do you want to lend something to the Lord? Do you want the Lord to be beholding to you? Do you want him to feel like he owes you something? I love that scripture. There are many others. Whoever is kind to the poor honors God. That's Proverbs 14, 31. Proverbs 14, 21. Blessed is the one who's kind to the poor. Proverbs 28, 27. Those who give to the poor will lack nothing. But all this is about earthly, for the most part, about earthly treasures. None of this talks about treasures in heaven. However, in both night, Mark, Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Luke 12, Jesus himself says, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Giving to the poor is important to the Lord. He took a lot of time to specify how he's going to bless you in heaven if you do that. Now, Jesus particularly singles out rewards when we give to people who have no ability to repay us in any way. If you're giving to someone and your expectation is that there's going to be some kind of return from that person, then you lose all those blessings. And Jesus singles this out in Luke 14, 12 to 14. He says, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. He says, don't invite rich people, have a feast and hope that they're going to invite you for a feast or that you're going to strike a business deal or they're going to feel beholden to you. He says, when you give a feast, invite the poorest people in the world and you'll be blessed because they can't repay you. And then this is the most profound thing in terms of this particular lesson. And, Germ and that's Germaine right now in this passage. He says, for you, he says, if you do this, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Wow. He is saying, clear out, if you give to people that don't have any ability to repay you, that can't give anything back to you just to bless them, then I see that. And he says, I will reward you in heaven. He says, they can't reward you. Those people that give you, they can't reward you. They might want to pay you back, but they can't. But he says, I can and I will. That is a powerful statement about ministering to the poor and the position he puts on them and our help to them in terms of our status in heaven long term. Number three, we lay up treasures in heaven when we experience persecution for the sake of the kingdom. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 11 through 12, he says, blessed are ye men when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for what? For great is your reward in heaven. How many of you are familiar with the voice of the martyrs? Anybody have any experience with that group? We subscribe to it and get regular newsletters and messages from them. What that group does is they collect money and, and, and resources, not just money, and distribute them to the persecuted church around the world. And in the process, they are very close to where Christians are being persecuted globally. And so they give updates. And what some people suffer for their faith is beyond belief. You know, there are people, and probably the worst prison you could ever hope to be in is North Korea. They don't have enough food for their own people, let enough for their prisoners. And so the torturing in North Korea's prisoner, North Korean prisons is, uh, is horrific. And yet many believers are put in those prisons for no other reason than because they profess verbally, they profess out loud, they profess publicly that they are followers of Jesus. 
Right now, if you read Martyr, Voice of the Martyrs, Christians are being tortured and dying for their faith in North Korea, Burma, China, Eritrea, India, Iran, Nigeria, Pakistan, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Syria, and Vietnam. Those people are paying a big price for their faith. And Jesus says, if you're persecuted for my sake, great is your reward in heaven. And that always reminds me or brings me to the thought of, so why are we not persecuted in this country? That's a question we should all ask ourselves. I'm not sure I know the whole answer, but I wonder if it's because Christians in this country are so milk toast and, and so reluctant to give the cause of the hope that's within them, as Jesus says, that we don't merit persecution or people don't even see that we are Christians, so they could persecute us. But maybe it's coming to this country, and for some, it's already here. If Donald Trump had not been elected president, and this is not an, an ad for or against him, but if he had not been elected president, we would have a Supreme Court that tells to the left. And Baron L. Stutzman, a florist in Oregon, who would have to pay hefty fines and risk the loss of her business because she refuses to do flowers for a gay wedding because of her religious beliefs. The same would happen to Jack Phillips, a Colorado baker who refused to bake a wedding cake for a gay couple for the same reason. And to the owners of the Kentucky screen printer who refused to print t-shirts for a gay pride festival also because of their religious beliefs. All three of these people are Christians. Now, maybe this is instructive about the direction this na the nation is going and what is going to happen to Christians in this nation long term and how we should be prepared for it and not surprised by it. I'm reading about a podcast that recently, um, um, uh, and first of all, all three of these cases had to go all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, that, that lower courts all ruled against them and would have fined them, made them forfeit their business, in some cases even put them in jail if they had not conformed to the world's view instead of to the, uh, to the scriptures. And, um, uh, and, but fortunately the Supreme Court uh, ruled in their favor. But the fact they had to go to the Supreme Court says a lot about where this nation uh, is headed. I'm reading about a podcast recently uh, with Hillary Clinton and Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. And Nancy Pelosi said during that podcast, and I quote, she said, Christians are willing to sell our whole democracy down the river because of abortion. Now, Nancy calls herself a Catholic, not a Christian, which is why she refers to Christians in third person. I'm not saying Catholics are not Christians. Don't do that. I'm saying she does not refer to herself as a Christian. She refers to herself as a Catholic. And when she refers to Christians, she used the third person. She does not say us. She says they. What she doesn't understand is that some Christians are, in fact, willing to sell this country down the river and anything else that compromises their obedience to God. It's not abortion that's the issue. It's obedience to God. Lost people don't understand that, and they don't like it, so they will try to shut it down by persecuting those who practice it. The more we practice it, the more likely we are to be persecuted. So what causes Christians to be persecuted? That brings me to number four. We lay up treasures in heaven when we take risk for the kingdom to honor God. In simple terms, that means we take a stand for our faith. We don't compromise our faith because it will make us unpopular. We don't uh, compromise our fa uh, faith because it will cause people to speak ill of us. You know, I've said before, and I still... Uh, uh, feel this way, but maybe I see some merit in it. I hate social media. It's such a way for people to bully long distance. You know, you can say anything you want about anybody, and they do. And unless you say what's politically correct nowadays, unless you take that middle of the road, I'm not going to say anything ill about anyone. I'm not going to say anything ill about anyone's practices. I'm not going to say anything at all except, gee, it's a nice day and I hope things go well for you. Say anything beyond that, someone's going to get on social media and they're going to, uh, to trash you. And so some people, because of that, are reluctant, especially on social media, to take a stand for their faith to say I'm a Christian or to take the Christian viewpoint because everyone piles on top uh, of them. But taking that stand according to Jesus out of his own mouth and allowing people to persecute us if we in the process proclaim the name of Jesus is what lays up treasures in heaven for us. 
Now, Scripture is full of people who made serious sacrifices for the kingdom. They sacrificed everything. And, and Jesus said their, re, their reward in heaven will be great. And matter of fact, you sometimes uses the kingdom as if you'll get the entire kingdom. He uses that term if you make this level of sacrifice. Stephen was the first, and we all know that. But Paul and all the disciples faced persecution and martyrdom for the kingdom. They took risk, but the risk paid off in people's coming to Christ. And that translates in the treasure in heaven. Now, we all know Bible characters aren't the only ones who did this. I've talked about him in the past. Jim Elliott gave his life, other Christians have, uh, so that the Warani Indians in Ecuador would come to Christ. He changed the whole tribe. He changed the whole tribe by his sacrifice. Susie and I know a missionary to South Sudan named Peter Swan. Now, he and his family live in what you would call difficult circumstances. They live in tents, or, or in some cases in mud huts, um, and they face difficult circumstances every day. And one of the things that they are most concerned about, and we pray about it a lot, is the presence of incredibly poisonous snakes in their town, in their area, in their compound. They had a green mamba in their hut. A couple of weeks ago, uh, I'm exchanging emails with him. He said, last night, uh, Titus, our youngest son, he was heading to his tent. He said, dad, snake. And, and so I had to come out with the light and there was a cobra in the path and they killed the, um, uh, the cobra. Um, their fear is compounded by the fact that they live in a country that is several hours away from any kind of anti-venom by airplane. By airplane, it's several hours into Uganda to find any kind of anti-venom. So they worry about that, and we pray about that. They have three children and teenagers and two small children, uh, a teenager and two smaller children. And they think about this every day. As a matter of fact, it's on Susie and I's mind. Susie has sent them two tools to repel snakes. And, uh, and uh, um, we're having a, a mixed um, success level with that. But it's on our minds in addition to their minds. Yet they don't come home. Yet they don't go, well, my kids are little when they're adults and when they grow up and when they go away. They take their kids and they put themselves and their kids at risk for the kingdom's sake. Believing that rewards in heaven are worth the risk here. And what is the result? Hmm. When Peter preaches, whole villages burn their idols. When Peter preaches, whole villages come down and fall on their knees and say, I want to know Jesus. When Peter preaches, witch doctors burn their idols, burn all their, their uh, occult stuff, and profess faith in Christ. Because the swans believe that the risk or the reward is worth the risk. The greater the risk, the greater the reward in heaven. That's right out of scripture. Fifth way to lay up treasures in heaven is to sacrifice many of the things in this life. In Matthew 19, 29, Jesus says, everyone who has forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundred, a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. What does Jesus say we will sacrifice for the kingdom? We will certainly put at risk for the kingdom if we live it the way he wants us to. Will we put our personal property at risk, our houses and lands? We'll put our friends at risk. Some of our friends will turn away from us that some of our family will turn away with us. It might be our father, our mother, our wife, our children. Essentially, what Jesus is saying is, be prepared to sacrifice everything for my name's sake, because you may have to. But if you do, he says, the rewards will be, and I have an old boss that he used to talk about things that were greater than he could imagine, and he would use that term. Wow, that's unimaginable. That was his favorite term, unimaginable. That's what Jesus is saying. He said, if you do these things, the rewards you'll have in heaven are unimaginable. That's why he said, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, neither has it even entered into the hearts of man. It means we can't even conceptualize it. We can't even perceive it. Nothing that we can imagine would come close to what kind of rewards we're going to have 
if we love the Lord and are obedient to him. That's why he says that eyes not seen, ears not heard. It hasn't even entered into the hearts of man. I'm a conceptual guy. I have a great imagination. I like to think, well, I can picture things. It says you can't picture how great your rewards will be. They are unimaginable. Now, side note here, ever notice how Jesus notices the little things? In Luke 8, we see the woman with the issue of blood press in among the crowd. Remember the crowds are surrounding Jesus and pressing into him because they all want to just touch him. They want to see him. They want to hear his, his voice. And she just reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' garment, he says, who touched me? And, uh, and the people on all sides of the disciples say, who touched you? How could we possibly know? There are hundreds of people all around. Everyone is touching you. How could we know who touched you? But Jesus noticed when one particular person touched him. And that's why I said, who touched you? That Jesus noticed the little thing. He noticed when someone touched him, when someone came close to him, even though many other people were vying for that same position. We see a similar instance in Mark 12. Jesus is reclining close to the temple treasury and watching everyone go up and make a big deal about their contributions. And Jesus is reclining. In my mind, I picture him kind of yawning there as all these rich guys throw up and and throw their money in and make a big deal about all the money they're putting in. And Jesus doesn't pay any attention to it because he's not going to give them a reward because he knows that they're not seeking a reward that he would give. They're seeking the reward that they get. They get a reward. They get the praise of the people. The people are go, oh my goodness, look at that guy. He's putting in thousands. So Jesus is kind of lying there yawning while all these rich people, you know, give their money and wondering probably, uh, the human part of him wondering when's this all going to be over and we can get to more important things. But then this little widow goes up and she throws two little mites, two little tiny coins into that big bucket. And Jesus all of a sudden sits up and he takes notice and he looks over there and he sees that woman and he says to the disciple, you know, that woman has given more than anyone else. And, you know, when he says that, you know, the disciples, as they often do, probably look at each other and go, she gave two mites. You know, Brother Nicodemus gave, you know, two talents. <laughs> so, you know, that, that the disciples probably act as they used to do. But Jesus noticed that. He noticed that widow giving that small amount. And the reason he did is because that giving came with risk. Jesus' recognition came because that giving came with risk. She risked not having food. She risked not having firewood. She risked not having whatever the sake uh, that she needed because she'd given every single thing she had, and she did it all for the sake of the kingdom. That's why Jesus said, give everything for the sake of the kingdom. When he said that, he was talking about her. Number six, we lay up treasures in heaven when we are rich, in good works. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 6, excuse me, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute. You know, sometimes we read scripture and we leave a verse out or we don't pay any attention to it. Uh, I was in a meeting the other day and someone quoted a scripture in that meeting. And, uh, and the scripture they quoted was, be anxious for nothing, but let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I took that guy aside afterward and I said, you left out a couple of really important words. I said, what Jesus said was, be anxious for nothing, but with thanksgiving. I've talked about this with you guys in the past before. The importance, if you're trying to dispel anxiety, one of the first things to do is start being thankful for what you have, and then you're less worried about the things you don't have. And so uh, that's why with thanksgiving is so important uh, in, in, uh, in that particular scripture. And so the same thing is true here. It says that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute. That means ready to give. That means ready to give away. You know, don't, don't just keep your, your good stuff to yourself, that the person who is rich in good works is supposed to distribute those good works, to give those things, willing to communicate. That means to talk to everybody at every level, laying up in store for themselves, laying up in store for themselves. Did I mention laying up in store for themselves? A good foundation against the time to come 
that they may lay hold on eternal life. Paul is saying, if you have material blessings in this life, be prepared to share that with others. Be prepared, ready to distribute. Look for opportunities to do good works. He says, if you do good works for others, when you do, you are laying up a foundation of rewards in heaven for yourself. Make distributing your good works, sharing your good works. Look for opportunities to good works, to do good works if you want to uh, let treasures in heaven. Every one of us ought to believers ought to have a quiet time in the morning. And one of the quiet part of our quiet times every morning is, Lord, make me a blessing to somebody. Show me how to distribute the good things that you would give me. Help me to relay the good works that you have done in my life. And then number seven, finally, make soul winning a priority. Do you know most people spend their entire lives without ever leading anyone to faith in Christ? Now, let me, I'm going to tighten that up a little. Not just most people, most Christians spend their entire lives and never lead one other person to faith in Christ other than their kids. Now, they contribute to their church and the missionaries and stuff, and they get some credit for that, and they frequently like to say that, well, you know, I support this and I support that, and, and that gives you know, me rewards in heaven, and it does. And Paul and uh, um, uh, Ray Bolts wrote a song one time about how when we get to heaven, we'll see some of our rewards we won't even know we have because we gave to a missionary that won someone else, uh, that won others, and, and we gave to an evangelist or we gave to the church building program that allowed to have a bigger Sunday school so more kids could be there and they could come to faith in Christ. And those are all valuable and worthwhile things. But let me tell you, a lot of people are trying to share a very small pie in that regard that very few people actually go out and win one single person in their life other than their kids. Daniel writes in Daniel 12, 3. He says, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Now, Daniel said, if you want to shine in heaven, you don't want to just be a barely visible light. If you want to be visible in heaven, if you want to be set a star in heaven that says that spend your earthly life turning others away from unrighteousness to righteousness, then you'll shine in heaven. He says, Daniel said, if you want your reward in heaven to be great, that's what he's saying. He uses Daniel's a poet. He uses, you know, that, that a more esoteric term, but he's saying, if you want your reward in heaven, then spend your life turning many to righteousness. Yet most believers don't even turn one to righteous, except perhaps corporally. Now, you heard me say many times, when we lead a single person to Christ, that person sits at the top of a pyramid of believers. And I've said that, and you guys have heard it, you know, that if you win your kids, and they win their kids, and they win their kids, and they win their kids, that each of us uh, uh, will be a top of pyramid of believers, for which we'll get some credit, and that is true. Unfortunately, now many days, many young people are turning away from Christ and in believing homes, they're not necessarily coming to Christ. So maybe that pyramid is shrinking uh, a little bit. The good news is if you win one single person out of your family to faith in Christ, then you have the ability to set mechanism in that other pyramid. And I've talked to you guys about that before. You can start a whole new pyramid by winning one single person to faith in Christ. One of the last things Jesus said while he was on this earth Perhaps the last thing, the last thing recorded in Matthew, and, and Matthew's got a pretty good synopsis of the gospel, uh, of the gospels, in Matthew 28, 19, 20, which is known as the Great Commission. And he says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now he was telling the disciples to go and be evangelists around the world, but that Great Commission wasn't just for disciples. He didn't say, all right, you 12 go you 11 i'm sorry go and and make disciples of all nations but that's the same mandate he gives to all of us he says go and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i've commanded you and lo, i'm with you always even into the end of the world now i'm here to not here to discuss donald trump's border policy with you and i think that rational minds need to prevail whatever the case is but let me tell you this we don't have to go to the world. <laughs> the world is coming to us. I am, uh, I mentor some young men. How am I doing for time? Am I almost out of time? Oh, I'm past time. Give me two minutes, I'll wrap up. 
I mentor some young men. We've been meeting for like 25 years. They were in my class years ago at First Baptist, and, and I continue to, um, to mentor um, uh, them and to uh, and 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 we study books. And one of the books now is the sequel to Seeking Jesus, by Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. It's called No God But One. And we're studying that book. And when one of the members of the group suggested it, I thought, why are we studying this book? I'm not excited about studying this book. But I began to reflect on that. The Islamic world is coming to our country. They're pouring in here every day. God is bringing the mission field to us. And so now I believe that I'm studying that book. So I will be prepared if God puts an Islamic person in my life to share my faith and to explain why what I believe is superior, is more truthful than what he or she believes. When God said, go to the ends of the earth, we don't have to go. But now God is bringing the ends of the earth to us if we will equip ourselves and prepare ourselves to share our faith. Make it a priority to win one person to Christ before you die and you will have rewards in heaven. So how do we lay up treasure in heaven? Make laying up treasure in heaven a goal, a priority. Sell what you have and give to the poor. Take a stand for your faith, even if you are persecuted, perhaps especially if you are persecuted for it. Take some risk for your faith. Sacrifice many of the things of this life. Be rich in good works. And make winning a single soul to Christ a priority in your life. If you do those things, you'll have treasures in heaven. When you get there, you're going to be pretty darn excited about it. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we'll make heavenly priorities your priorities, our priorities. I pray that every day we'll seek to lay up treasure in heaven, not just so that we'll have it, although we are looking forward to it, but that so you will be glorified. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Bill. That was really good for just 30-minute notice. You did really well. <laughs> Great lesson. Enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll tell you, a quick way to uh, win people to, to Christ is just enter the prison ministry. My yeah. goodness. It's like fishing yeah. out of a bucket. <laughs> yeah. Uh, before we leave, I just wanted to say, because I don't know that I'll be in touch with you guys um, before this happens, but the end of February, Lauren's having baby number two, wow. and I uh, talked to her for a long time this morning. She's having a lot of discomfort, just hips hurting, everything hurting, just part of pregnancy. She knew that, but anyway, if you guys would be praying for a healthy baby and a, a good birth experience. Her first birth experience was terrible delivery. Um, so she has some anxiety about that. Anyway, I appreciate your prayers on that. All right. Well, Carolyn, if we could add that to the prayer list. And also, there was one that was sent by the Wright family, uh, Jim Wright. Uh, it says uh, he's having prostate surgery tomorrow at 7.30 a.m. So if we could add Jim Wright to the prayer list as well. That was in the chat. All right. Um. Yeah, anyone knows what's happening to our brother, Carlos? Carlos Puig? Uh, yeah, he's been yeah. absent a couple of weeks now, our doctor. Yeah, I spoke to, I spoke to him uh, yes, two days ago, okay. recently, and he's just been busy working. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Dorothy, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to share something. Um, First, uh, thank you, Bill, for the lessons. And uh, I knew you were not going to be short of words to say, uh, even, if, <laughs> even if you were only given five minutes. You know, you can just pull up something from your hat any minute. But uh, thank you for that. And I wanted to appreciate the uh, pastor's um, uh, lesson or um, seminar, but he's preaching today. Um, uh, then, on top of uh, listening to him, I, I listened to Rick Warren this morning, and he said something that I kind of wanted to share with the group as far as, you know, when I was listening to Bill uh, talking about uh, the, the word and persecution, but what I got out of Warren today is what has been really kind of on my mind is that he said, you know, there's wickedness in all of us. He's, he paraphrased it that way, that we're all wicked. So, 
it's just like Jesus saying, before you tell your brother to remove the beam from his eyes, uh, remove the uh, big old tree in your in your eyes first, so you can see. But he he pretty much was saying, in, in this time, we need to focus on what uh, as a nation to pray. And that prayer that says, if my people who are called by my name, and he went over, if they will repent, they turn from their wicked ways and they will repent and they will seek my face, then I will, and he mentioned that, then I will hear them. And so he went on, this caught my attention because he said, let me tell you all the wickedness that we practice. And he wasn't just talking Really, he was not even really talking to the lost. He's talking to us. And so he mentioned uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, where it says godlessness in the last days. And he says, mark, but mark this, there will be terrible times then um, in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And it ends by saying, have nothing to do with them. I just wanted to say, we need to be more introspective in this time that we live and not let the devil have a foothold in the church. Thank you very much. Dorothy, let me add something on that. I've been thinking about that verse too, because I hear it quoted all the time. Um, and, and the prayers that I normally hear when somebody is wanting to quote that verse is forgive us our nation, forgive our nation, Lord, for allowing homosexuality to be approved and forgive us our nation for all the babies that we kill and forgive us. It's very rarely that we repent of our own sin. And I think what that's what that verse is calling us repent the sin in my life, not as I can't repent for everybody else. I can't exactly. repent for Dorothy. I can't repent for Donald Trump or Joe Biden or our nation, any of those people, only for myself. So as you said, to be introspective and to look at what prejudices do I have? What evaluations do I make just from somebody's appearance? This, you know, uh, am, I, am I selfish? Am I storing up so much in my 401k and in my savings that I don't want that I pass people by that need my help. I just look past them and think, boy, I'm glad that's not me. Those are things that we need to repent of in our own life, not the generic sin of our country. That's what I think that verse is calling us. He says, our people, if my people. So I'm in full agreement with you and Rick Warren. So I stand in good company, Dorothy. Thank you, Susie. <laughs> I miss you, though. Thank you. <laughs> I miss you too, sweetheart. Uh, all right guys well that was a really good lesson and even a great follow-up so uh i don't see anybody else's mic unmuted so we are done for the day i'm going to stop the recording and so if you want to hear this again it's it was recorded uh i missed the first couple of minutes but other than that so